Greetings! Today I want to share my experience from past years on volcanic injury to vegetable plants growing at different distances from Kilauea's Alema Umau crater. By the way, I took this photo of a volcanic eruption in the 1970s. The landscape in the immediate vicinity of Halema Umau is like a moonscape. Nothing is growing. To study the volcanic effects on plants, it would be best to start close to the volcanic source. So I chose an area several hundred yards from the Halema Umau crater. There are multiple sulfur emission points and there was a strong smell of sulfur in the air. Mucus developed in my throat, <clears throat> and I kept clearing my throat. <clears> throat. I placed several pots of partially grown Chinese cabbage in the area and left the plants to see what would happen. Returning to the site a week later and clearing my throat again, <clears throat> I noticed the plants were obviously bleached and necrotic from the fumes and would not survive to maturity. So I just picked up my plants, cleared my throat again, <clears throat> and went home. Yes, I had proved the obvious. Chinese cabbage plants cannot be grown right next to the Hale Ma Uma U crater where nothing else grows. Crops growing here will always die. Now, Let's travel about five miles in a straight line from the Halema Umau crater to an agricultural area where there are nearby farms growing flowers and vegetables in the open fields and in greenhouses. There is abundant foliage growth in this area. The University of Hawaii operates an agricultural experiment station at this 4,000 foot elevation. The farm has both field and greenhouse crops and a water catchment reservoir. There are various types of greenhouses on the farm and they would be better described as plastic covered rain shelters because they don't have environmental equipment such as fans and heaters and typically the sides and ends are at least partially open. We noticed that metal such as roofing and fence posts rust faster than most places and even this padlock became severely corroded. Normally, there is no sulfur odor in this area. However, there are occasions where the smell of sulfur is evident, and it may be stronger or weaker depending upon the wind and atmospheric conditions. The length of time and time of day will vary amongst episodes. Plant injury generally coincides with episodes where there is a strong smell of sulfur. After such a sulfur dioxide episode, Sometimes, but not always, we observe foliage injury to plants growing both in the open field and under greenhouse cover. Foliage appears to be burned with such symptoms as bleaching, browning of tissues, leaf spots, or blights and chlorosis, and was likely caused by sulfur in the air combining with dew or fog or high moisture content in the air to form sulfuric acid. Nelson and Siwaki have published an excellent article where they suggest that sulfur dioxide enters mesophyll tissue through the stomates, thus forming sulfuric acid in this moist area, and this burns plant tissue and results in plant injury. In those situations when plants escape injury from an episode of high sulfur dioxide in the middle of the day, one possibility is it may have been related to generally dry conditions such as in the middle of the day when the relative humidity is lower. Nelson and Siwaki suggested that if the stomates remain closed due to water stress or other causes, plants may escape severe injury. Here is severe burning on lettuce growing in a greenhouse. Lettuce has an annual growth habit and will not really grow out of this injury. This crop was terminated. A sulfur dioxide episode severely burned these greenhouse tomatoes. However, lush green growth emerged from the tomato plants. New clusters of blossoms emerged and we had a bumper crop of tomatoes. Microclimates exist such as low spots where there is more plant damage. During moderate episodes, there have been situations where the outer or perimeter rows of plants in a greenhouse experience more damage than the inner rows. 
However, during severe episodes, all the plants suffer damage. We have seen that at a five mile distance from Kilauea volcano, plant damage occurs sometimes in both greenhouses and the open field, but not so often as to prevent farms from successfully operating there. Let's turn our attention to the Kona district, which is about 40 to 50 miles from the Kilauea site. We will discuss injury to field grown tomatoes in a five mile vicinity around the University of Hawaii Cooperative Extension Building and the Kona Agricultural Experiment Station. From the winter of 1969 to the summer of 1973, that's a long time ago folks, but I was there, tomato injury symptoms coincided with a Kilauea volcano eruption period and the appearance of a definite haze now referred to as VOG, which is a volcanic smog. Here is an example of VOG between the Kamuela and Kona areas. The haze was apparently caused by fumes from Kilauea volcano. Yeah, I know it's difficult to see the VOG due to all the haze. There were stories floating around that fishing boats, which relied on various landmarks to guide their location and distance from shore, became lost because the VOG obscured the landmark. During this time, tomatoes developed a mysterious disease with symptoms such as blossom drop. This happened to be a Japanese tomato variety, but it also happened on the University of Hawaii tomato varieties. Other symptoms included poor fruit set, hollow, small, and almost seedless fruits, and no saleable fruit. There was no sulfur odor, but could the volcanic haze or VOG be causing this disease? Another symptom was a less luxuriant appearance. For example, these field-grown tomatoes looked okay, but not vibrant, and they produced no saleable yield. Perhaps some of the pollutants in the voggy air would be captured by the rainfall. A rainwater sample was analyzed and found to have a pH of 4. This is quite acidic. Yes, folks, it seems like we have some acid rain here. The sample contained both chloride and sulfate ions. The pH of samples from heavy rainfall episodes were less acidic, with a pH of 4.4, than from a series of lighter rains where the pH was 4.0. Apparently, the first portion of a rainfall absorbs most of the pollutants and is the most damaging to the plants. At the time, I was living in Glenwood, which is only 11 miles away from the Kilauea volcanic site. The rain had a more moderate pH of 5.8. This was probably due to a different wind pattern and a very high rainfall of over 200 inches per year. My office was in Hilo, which is about 24 miles from the eruption site. It has a rainfall of over 140 inches per year. There was infrequent haze depending upon the wind pattern, and the pH from two rain samples was 4.5 and 5.0. So the pH of the Kona rain is definitely lower than either Glenwood or Hilo. Let's postulate how polluted rainfall could damage tomatoes. Tomato symptoms included a soft hollow fruit containing few seeds and inadequate gel in the locules. Poor pollen germination or pollen tubes which are too short could result in less seed production. Failure to produce seed could result in less gel and cause a puffy or hollow fruit. Briefly, tomato pollination occurs when the male part, or the anther, produces pollen which is blown by wind or moved by bees to the female flower part, which is the stigma. Pollen germinates and grows down into the ovary and combines or fertilizes the ovules and eventually seeds are formed. A gel-like substance forms to surround the seeds in the locules or cavities. Poor pollination results in less gel formation and puffy or somewhat hollow fruit. Can rainwater affect pollen germination? Well, Dr. Brubaker advised me how to add tomato pollen to rainwater samples and collect the germination data. Pollen spores floating in pH 4 Kona rainwater did not germinate. However, pollen spores floating in distilled water with a pH of 5.6 germinated just fine. 
But then we noticed that increasing the pH of the acidic Kona rainwater with sodium hydroxide to a pH of 5.7 did not increase pollen germination. Perhaps there are factors other than pH causing poor pollen germination. The tomato plants had a less luxuriant appearance. Perhaps nutrients and organic compounds were leached from the plants by the acidic rainfall. To study this, leaf discs were immersed in rainwater samples for four hours and the amounts of calcium, magnesium, and potassium leaching from the tissue were measured. As expected, more of the calcium, magnesium, and potassium were leached from the lower pH water samples. However, increasing the Kona pH 4.0 water to 5.7 with sodium hydroxide resulted in more leaching than from pH 5.6 distilled water. Thus, it was suspected that there were other compounds in the rainwater. Gas chromatography analysis revealed the presence of 27 organic compounds, the sum of which was in the part per billion range. Oahu rainwater, 200 miles away, contained these types of compounds in the part per trillion range, or 1,000 fold less. Compounds were not individually identified, as that would have been pretty advanced science nearly 50 years ago. The volcanic pollution had traveled 40 to 50 miles or more, depending upon the wind currents, and there was an opportunity for the fumes to be exposed to time and sunlight and cause reactions to form new pollutant compounds. It appears that a combination of low pH and other pollutant materials in the rainwater were damaging to tomatoes. A solution of the problem for the growers would likely involve protecting the plants from rainfall by a greenhouse or rain shelter. So I cut some wild strawberry guava trees which had very flexible trunks which are less than 2 inches in diameter and I built two small rain shelters which are about 12 by 15 feet by bending arches and covering them with clear polyethylene. The rain shelters were built on Richard Matsumoto's farm and he also helped with the project. The unprotected plants growing outside produced no saleable yield. However, plants growing under the rain shelter were very healthy and grew taller than Professor Fukunaga pictured here and they produced about 13 pounds of saleable fruit per plant. Yes, the answer was to protect the plants from the rainfall. Now the plants were watered with rainfall that was caught and stored in a small catchment pond, but the water was applied to the soil, not to the foliage. And so the growers built various types of greenhouses to protect their tomatoes from rainfall. These beautiful bamboo structures were built by Mr. Sonata for his tomato crop. Here, Professor Fukunaga displays some beautiful tomatoes growing in a greenhouse at the University of Hawaii Experiment Station. By the way, we published this study in the Journal of Environmental Quality more than 40 years ago. We have seen that the character and circumstances of volcanic caused plant injury is affected by distance from the volcanic eruption site. I'm sure that current and future volcanic eruptions will provide both similar and also new experiences for the growers and researchers. For now, I bid you Aloha!